So um, I had some ideas for our title today, uh, as we know our series is When We Pray. So the first one I thought of was When We Pray, We Become Superheroes. Wouldn't that be cool? Just pray and bang, that's it. Marvel, no? Okay, no one's interested. Uh, When we pray, time stands still. Yes, time stands still a lot of the time in our lives, not just when we pray. Uh, When we pray, we can tame wild animals. Who's into zoology? No, no one wants to go against the lions or the tigers or the bears. Oh, my. And when we pray, hey, it rains. Well, a lot of people pray this week and then a lot of rain came this week. (laughs) All these things can happen. Uh, But my title for my message today is actually, When We Pray, God Moves. Uh, If you have your Bibles with you today or the Bible app, if you want to open up to 2 Corinthians 10, we're going to keep coming back to these verses um, throughout the whole message here. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. So today we're gonna explore, um, I'm gonna explore with you what happens when we pray. Um, We're gonna look back on some good Old Testament greats who taught us about prayer very, very early on um, and see uh, what we can learn from them. So we're going to start with the story of Job. I'm just going to paraphrase some stories through here. Job was a very faithful man. He loved God. He worshipped God and he worshipped God. He lived a very comfortable life. He'd worked hard, got lots of possessions, sheep, oxen, camels, and had a great family. Who has a big family here? Some of us. Job had 10 kids. That's (laughs) That's <laughs> just, a, just a few too many for some, yes. <laughs> but then Satan decided it was time to test Job, to see if he would actually go against his belief in God. So first of all, he took away all the livestock, camels, oxen, sheep, goats. Oh, goat's milk, that's good. Then he, the, the house blew down and he killed, the, ch- the children were killed. His servants got killed and taken away. Even his friends were no support for him. They mocked him when he just continued to keep praising God. When he got sick, his wife was no help. She also turned around and said, well, why don't you stop praising God? So if there's any reason or any time to give up on God, I'm sure you agree with me. Mm, This could be it. But Job kept worshipping God. Job kept praying to God. Job did not let Satan change his mind. Eventually, Satan gave up. God healed Job. He even gave Job more children. Ten wasn't enough. As we read in Job 42 verse 10, when Job, Job sorry, prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. So remember, Job's friends mocked him. What does this passage say? Job prayed for his friends and God healed him and restored his life better than what it was before. So there's a great example there of yeah, praying and being very fervent in your prayer. Don't stop praying. When we pray, what happens? God moves. God heals. God restores when we pray. Let's now move to Elijah. Elijah lived in a time when the Israelites were not following God as they should have been. They worshipped the gods from all the people around them. They did not put God first in their lives. They, in fact, ignored God. So Elijah was a messenger from God, sent to try to get the people to put him first in their lives again. So what did God do? He stopped all the rain and the dew from falling to the earth. It will not rain again until the Israelites remembered God and made him their God. This, of course, is going to bring about famine. Think about it. No rain. How do those crops grow? I know my garden, I just love it when it rains. I get to see these little green things just popping up in the, in the uh, soil. We need that rain. So there was famine and there was no food. Elijah was going to be the one that was going to pass on the message at the right time from God as to when the rains would start again. 
So there were a few things that happened. I'll just cut the story short. A few miracles that happened. And then the Israelites went, yep, okay, that's it. Sorry, God, we did forget you were God. And stopped worshipping all these other guys and just went straight for the one and only God. Faith, God sorry, Elijah was faithful in waiting for God's timing. He was faithful in constantly talking to God. We see this in James 5, verse 17. Elijah was as human as we are. He was just one of us. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for how long? Three and a half years. I get stressed out when my garden doesn't have rain for four days. Three and a half years it took for the Israelites to work out what they needed to be doing. So Elijah then decided, okay, this is time. God's saying this is about time. The, the rains are going to come. Anyone remember that ad? The rains are here. The rains are here. They're almost here. So Elijah sent his son, uh, sorry, servant to look at the horizon to see if there was any rain coming. Nothing. So Elijah still believed God was going to bring the rain. So he sent a servant again. Nothing. He did this a total of seven times. Talk about faithfulness. Let's not stop. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep praying. Seven times. That servant did some running, I tell you. Could do a marathon or two. On the last trip, the servant finally saw a small cloud. They say it was the size of a fist. That's how small it was. And they believed it was going to rain. And it was going to end the famine and the drought. Something as small as a fist. Where's our faith? Are we believing in that cloud as small as a fist? A fist, when God says it's going to be there. One Kings eighteen forty five forty six says, and soon the sky was black with clouds. From a cloud this big, all of a sudden the sky was full of black clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab, who was the king at the time, left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his coat in his belt and he ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. What did I say about superheroes? He ran faster than the chariot, faster than the horses. Just by Elijah's prayers, the rain stopped and then started. Elijah being faithful to pray and trust God meant that the Israelites were shown God's almighty powers. So we've seen Job who was uh, in suffering. We've seen Elijah who was faithful, went through famine and drought. And as I said, there's plenty of other miracles to, to read from both of those stories. But we're going to move on to Joshua. A lot of us know the story of Joshua with the Battle of Jericho, which in itself is a massive miracle. He also uh, was a, a miracle of parting the sea for the Israelites to cross. But the, the one story we don't hear about often, which I really want to actually come to today, is when the sun stood still. And this is not just documented in the Bible. It is also documented in lots of other historical um, books as well. So Joshua and the Israelites were helping a neighbouring group of people with a battle. They hadn't yet finished the battle, but Joshua knew they needed to completely you know, end the battle. Otherwise, the enemies would be able to regain strength and come back and beat them again. So what did Joshua do? Any ideas? I prayed. Yes, you're getting it. This is good. <laughs> Joshua knew the only way for this to happen was to talk to God. He prayed. Find out what God wanted to do. So God made the sun stand still. In Joshua 10, verses 12 and 13, we see, On the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites, Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel. He said, Let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Adelon. So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. God has total control over creation. Joshua trusted the lives of all those who were fighting into God's hands and God was faithful. As I said, another title, when we pray, time stands still. God can make anything happen. Daniel was another faithful man of God. Daniel was famous for praying. He was also famous for praying. And he was famous for praying. <laughs> the king's sidekicks at the time uh, that Daniel was around wanted everyone to worship the king. They were doing this as a ploy to try and get Daniel in trouble. If we can make it a law that the only person you can worship is our king, and Daniel goes and does his praying, 
they can get rid of him because he was outdoing them all. So when the king made this law, signed the papers and everything, what was Daniel's response? We see in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down at his usual in his upstairs room with his windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God, just as he had always done. Just because of what was going, around, going on around him, he didn't change what he always did. He prayed. And this is sort of also shadowing what Job was doing. Job was being persecuted, was struggling with all the suffering. What did he do? He prayed and worshipped God. So as a result of Daniel constantly praying, we all know he was thrown into a lion's den. Our God tames the wild animals. And Daniel was not harmed at all. So in these stories, we've seen the physical evidence of God at work when people pray. There are obviously some supernatural wars happening. If we think back to Job's story, it was Satan who actually approached God and said, hey, don't like this guy, can I do something with him? But God has complete control over the supernatural as well as what we can see. If we think back to that verse, I said, keep your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians 10. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We're not like Joshua, who is out there fighting battles with shields and swords and spears and people. We are here waging a war that is supernatural. And when we say yes to Jesus, when we say that's the God that we want to follow, just like in Job's story, Satan comes after us. We have a fight, not as humans do. I'd like to now look at Jesus. Always nice to bring things back to Jesus. We've gone through the Old Testament. Let's jump into the New Testament. Um, here, Jesus is about to be betrayed and crucified, and Jesus knew this had to be done to fulfill God's promises to us. But it wasn't going to be fun. So he was explaining to his father, God, that it was only because of it being God's will that he was willing to go ahead. I haven't put up this up on a slide, but it's a passage in Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46, where he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. So literally, this is just about before he's about to be betrayed. Um, actually, at the end of this passage, it says, here comes his betrayer. So he's in anguish. He knows this is going to hurt. This is not fun. What does he want to do? He wants to go and talk to his father. He wants to go and pray. He went a little further, bowed with his face to the ground. Oh, sorry, I should say also, he took a few disciples with him as well. Um, I, that, yeah, that'll take place in the next part of the story. So he, yes, he went a bit further, uh, bowed his face to the ground, praying, my father, is, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch me even for one hour? Now I have to say, I'll just pop into the, the human world here. I do agree, I, I do understand the, the disciples a little bit here in the mornings when I do my prayers. I do pray with my eyes open because I know that if I close them, I'll probably fall asleep. <laughs> so I do know where the disciples are at right now. Uh, but no, let's go back to Jesus. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to the disciples, what, was, what were they doing? <sighs> Sleeping again. Yeah. So he went and prayed a third time. Again, what did he do? What he always did, prayed again and again. When Jesus had a dilemma, when Jesus was struggling, when Jesus was tempted, Jesus prayed. And when Jesus prayed, he modelled it for us. He said, your will be done. When we say your will be done, we're effectively saying, I can't do this. This is not about me. This is about you. And I was thinking about a sort of a conversation. The week we have this all the time with people. I often have it with my husband. Hey, what are we doing this weekend? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. I don't care. Whatever you decide. Okay, well, let's do this then. We've basically given up our decides and given it to somebody else to decide. We're letting them make the decisions. Um, as you know, my husband does cook really nice food, so when it comes to what's for dinner, I don't know. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> it's about giving up. It's not about me. It's about somebody else making the decision for me. When we say this to God, 
Okay, it won't just be about dinner when we're talking to God or what we should do in our free time. But this is our surrender to God. This is where we say, it's not about me. It's about you. Most of the time when we're seeking God, we're going way beyond that earthly realm. We're wanting to think about things that are not just, as I say, about dinner. Some great words in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. God has given us an amazing brain. Nowhere near as amazing as big as his. Do not depend on how we feel, on how we think as humans. We must depend on God. And if we seek his will, what does it say there? He'll show you which path to take. Our God is an all-in God. He's everywhere. He knows all things. He's all-powerful. There is a limitation to what we are able to do. And when we reach that limit, that's where God steps in. When we reach our human limit, the supernatural steps in, and that supernatural is our God. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely have times of overcooking some things. Things going well, things going not so well. Things that consume our thoughts. We can start to head down a very bad train of thought. Yeah, we can start to think badly of somebody, which is so unnecessary. We can start to think that everything's going to go badly. We can think all sorts of things that are not God's will. Thinking back to that 2 Corinthians passage, we see the encouragement to capture our thoughts and turn them around. We are the ones in charge of what we let happen in our heads. Yes, thoughts will appear. Emotions will happen. But what we do with them next is what is important. If we are focusing on God's will, what God's word teaches us, speak with God regularly, which is called praying. Luke Hayward's really got it well now. Yeah. Yep. Then we will know how to capture these thoughts and turn them into God's way of thinking. So so looking at that passage, we see we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy the false arguments. And if we look at the same passage in actually verse 5 in the Passion Translation, I just love the strong words here. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow down in obedience to the anointed one. It's about turning everything around and giving it to God. But as I said, if we're constantly praying, if we're constantly talking to God, if we're constantly reading his word, we'll know how to turn those around. Have those words in our minds constantly. When we pray, we're putting God's ability to solve the problem ahead of our own desires. When we pray, we need to let go of what we think we can do. Let go of what we think the end result should be. Let go of our dreams, wants and desires. I'll just get the team back up um, onto the platform. <clears throat> so we saw some supernatural events when the, Greek, the greats from the Old Testament prayed. And when we pray, as I said before, there are supernatural things happening all the time. We may not see it. As we have admitted, we do not have the strength to carry out those miracles. We ourselves cannot tame that lion. We cannot you know, have the sun stop in the middle of the day just because it was fun. We don't have the wisdom for any situations. And that is when the Holy Spirit is moving. And that is the supernatural that we get to experience. I just want to take us back to the song we were singing before um, I got up about breathing in the Holy Spirit. There's so much power in that. And think about all of those miracles I was talking about in the words of that song. You won't see wind. You won't see rain. The drought will end. Everything will change. All about that Holy Spirit within us. So God knows our thoughts, our feelings, but he wants to hear them from us. 
He also then wants to get those mighty angels that he has and his Holy Spirit moving to accomplish his will in us and through us. Most of the time we have no idea what that might be. But when we pray, giving up that control, letting him be the one making the decision, God will move. The amazing part too is God will even move if we don't pray. God is there. Hey, we may not know what to pray. You may not know how to pray. This is where God's spirit comes in. It doesn't matter what we say. The spirit is there for us. In Romans 8, 26, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Praise God he gave us his spirit. We don't have to do it on our own. It's not just about our earthly beings. We have that spirit in us. There's a force greater than us who wants the best for us. And he's a God who is faithful. He's a God who wants us to know him. He's a God who wants us to include him in our lives and trust him in all the unknown. Can I just encourage you as we enter the last week, as Luke was saying, of the time of prayer of fasting as a church, to be considering what 2025 looks like with God in your life. What does it look like with God making the decisions? What does it look like for you to surrender to God? Do you want this spirit in you? Do you want this spirit praying with you? Do you want this spirit praying for you? If that's you, and if this is the first time you've wanted to have Jesus as part of your life, if you want to open that spiritual heavenly realm and let God move, I've got a prayer that we can all share together. So eyes, uh, sorry, heads bowed and eyes closed. If that's you, If this is the first time that you're wanting God to be in your life, for Jesus to be the king of your life, first and foremost, the first part of every decision you make through God, just raise your hand so I know I can be praying with you here. God's spirit is there for everybody. Let's breathe him in. Let's surrender to God all our thoughts, all our feelings. Let the Spirit speak to us. We're just going to finish with a prayer together, committing our lives to Jesus and making him the king of our lives. Repeating after me. Jesus, this is my decision. Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. You died on the cross. You died on the cross. To pay the price for my sin. To pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my savior. I invite you to be my savior. Come into my life. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Forgive my sin. Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.